Now let's talk about data sources. Data sources are tools that can be used to store or create numerical values for other tools and objects to use. Some data sources use mathematics, but you don't have to worry about that now. We'll cover most of that in later tutorials. So let's discuss the different types of data sources. Go to Tools, Triggers and Events, and scroll to Data Sources. The first one is the Curved Data Source. This tool can change from one value to another over a set amount of time, with a certain type of equation to get there. In Properties, let's first skip down to Start and End. This is where you set the two numbers the data source will switch between. Below that is Duration. This number represents the amount of time it will take to transition between the two numbers. So, for example, if you start the value at 0 and end up at 60, setting the duration to 1 minute will mean each second the value will increase by 1. Keep in mind though, the curved data source will change its number with each tick, so the number is always changing, even if it's in very small increments. Now let's scroll back up to start countdown state. This dictates when the tool will activate. I've set up a rotating board beside the router at the start to show you how each setting works. We are using an object position event to rotate the board. Don't worry, we'll talk more about object position events in a later tutorial. In the object position event properties, we have the z-axis connected to this curved data source. In the curved data source properties, the start number is set to 0 and the end number is set to 360, so we can rotate the board one full revolution. The duration is set to 2 seconds and the loop checkbox is checked so the board will continue to rotate. To power the whole thing, we're using an interval trigger, with the interval set to 1 so it sends an impulse every frame, or 60 impulses per second. The event filter is connected to the object position event. I've also added a 3 second delay to the start countdown in track properties. This is to show you what each setting does. Remember, when setting start countdown state, you will always have to match that setting in all the tools used for the animation. To test this, we'll do a hard restart by pressing down on the right stick, or R3. The first setting, after start, starts when the rider starts. Before countdown, activates as soon as the track loads. You see, the animation is already running as soon as it fades in from black. On full restart, starts after the countdown delay is complete, or on a checkpoint restart. You see, the animation waited 3 seconds after the fade in from black and then started running. At 1 second from the 3 to 1 does exactly that. Starts at 1 in the countdown. Next is Curve. This affects the speed of the change between the start and end numbers. For example, the top animation is set to quadratic ease in out, which will make the animation start off slow, speed up in the middle, and slow down at the end. The bottom setting is linear, which is a constant speed from start to end. There are too many settings here to discuss, but there are many resources online that explain curves or easing functions. You can search tween transitions and find graphic representations of each animation. Easings.net has nice graphic examples of many of these curve settings and we will share this link in the video's description. Next is Offset Ticks. We have seen this option before in the trigger lesson. This number is based on the game clock and what it does is starts the data source off at the number you set here instead of the start number. Looping sets the data source to run continuously. Now the data source will count from the start number to the end number and then start the whole count over again. Invert second half will make the count take half the duration time to get to the end and then reverse the sequence back to the start. Reset when disabled will reset the data source if you use a state event to disable it. Enabling and disabling this tool with a state event is a good way to control when the change takes place. Otherwise, this tool will start to change automatically with the game clock or the start of the track. Finally is Reset at Checkpoint Restart. This resets the data source when the router resets a checkpoint, and Reset on Full Restart will reset this tool when the track is restarted. Next is Curve Vector Data Source. We're going to talk about vectors in a later tutorial. Driving Line Position is next. This tool will give you the world coordinates of a point on the driveline at ground level. In the properties, we have Position Component. This is where you can select the X, Y, or Z position you want to use. Next is Distance. This is where you can set the distance on the driveline you want to use the position coordinates. 
So, if we wanted to place an object at 70 meters away from the starting point on the driveline, we could use this tool to set the X, Y, and Z coordinates of that position. The next data source is Game Variable Data Source. This tool will give you various game sources as the value. In Properties, we only have one option, Type. This determines which source value you want to use. Notice when you change the type, you get a bit of an explanation of the setting and the values you can expect from each. If you set this to any value that uses the controller, you also get a slider to select which controller you get the value from. For Trials Tracks, you'll always want to use Bane, but it is possible to create some local multiplayer skill games for which this will be an invaluable tool. Next we have Get Vector, another vector tool we'll discuss in a later tutorial. Object Array is next. Use this with the Object Retriever. This tool allows you to select multiple objects and then retrieve or connect to them by using an index number. For example, I put down a few explosive effects. Now we can select them all with the Object Array and Properties under Select Target Objects. The first object we select is assigned an index number, starting with 0. The next object is number 1, the next one is 2, and so on. Now we can place an Object Retriever and connect it to the Object Array. This allows us to target one of the objects by selecting an index number we want to use. Say we want to set off the second explosion effect. Since the object index numbers start with zero, we will select one to connect with the second explosion. Lastly, let's add an effect event and an area trigger to set off the explosion. We connect the on hit of the area trigger to the effect event and connect the event target of the effect event to the object retriever. Next we have the Object Info Data Source, which uses info like position, rotations, or directions to get an object's value. In the Properties menu, it only has two options. Select Object is how you select the object you want the info on, and Type is how you select the info you want to use. Quickly going through these, Position, Angle, Direction, Side and Up, X, Y, and Z use the position and angle of an object in the game world to get the info. Applied Force gives you just what it says, the amount of force applied to the object. Hit Points is the number of hit points an object has. Velocity and Angular Velocity X, Y, and Z gives you the speed of an object or the speed of its rotation on a single axis. Speed gives you the object's overall speed on all axes. Driving Line Position uses the object's position on the driving line. On screen is a true false value. If the object is on screen, its value is 1, and if the object is off screen, its value is 0. Screen position X, Y, and C are numeric values of an object's position. With X, 0 is the center of the screen, negative 1 is all the way to the left, and 1 is all the way to the right. With Y, 0 is center, 1 is the top of the screen, and negative 1 is the bottom of the screen. With Z, 0 is far away from the camera, and 1 is right at the camera. Distance to ground is the distance in meters the object is from the ground. Animation length is the length of an animated object's loops, like NPCs or animals. Now let's look at the random data source. This tool sets a random number between two set numbers at an interval of your choice. In the Properties menu, the first thing we want to look at is Minimum and Maximum. This is where you set the two numbers that you want the random number to be between. These numbers will be included in the random pick of numbers. Interval sets how often the data source sets the new value. Reseed and Seed all have to do with how the random data source generates its values. Technically, the numbers it generates are not truly random. The values are generated by a mathematical logarithm. This logarithm uses the minimum and maximum values along with the seed value to generate the new values. So, set two data sources with the same minimum, max, and seed values and they will always generate the same new values. If you want to get truly random values, you can change the seed values while the game is running. To do this, we'll need an object info data source, and let's connect it to the rider and set the type to speed. Now by setting the random data source's seed value to the object info data source, we can get a wider variation of random numbers because not all riders will ride at the same speed. Next is two dimensional vector. Once again, we'll talk about vectors in a later tutorial. Next is Variable Data Source. This is a tool to hold one number. If you remember, we've used this in previous tutorials by using a set value event to change its value. Now let's check out the properties. The first option is Value. This is where you set the value of the data source for the start of the game. 
Reset at checkpoint restart will reset the value to the original value if you reset a checkpoint. Interpolate brings up some new options, which changes how the data source reacts when the value is changed. With this checked, the number will not change immediately, but will gradually change over time to the new number. For example, I've set up this animation to show you what happens when we change the value of the variable from 0 to 4. Under type, exponential is similar to the curved data source example quadratic ease in out. A smooth swooping change. Interpolation speed sets how quickly the number will change. Linear is a straight change at even speed. Step sets the value the number can change for each tick. Damp spring is similar to elastic out in the curve data source's curve settings. The number will spring to the new number. Spring adjusts the amount of spring that is applied when interpolating. Damping is similar to damping in physics joints. It slows the interpolation movement. Now how do we use these data sources? Well, just about any option in the properties menu that uses a value, checkbox, or slider can be tied to a data source and changed during gameplay. If it's a value, once set, the data source will now be used as the properties option value. If it's a checkbox, a value of zero will equal unchecked and a value of one will equal checked. You can use this on an enabled checkbox to turn on and off effects or tools. If it's a slider, the first option in the slider will be zero and each option after that will be one higher number. So for example, if an object has four options in the slider, the values will be zero through three. 